Welcome back to the channel. I hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are around this beautiful planet of ours. Today's video, we are discussing the markets with pro trader Gareth Soloway. It's nice to get on different people to the channel with different ideas and expectations of their opinions of where the market could go over the coming months and potentially years, just so that we're not stuck in an echo chamber of our own beliefs. Gareth is a pro trader of over 20 years and is very active on crypto Twitter. So go give him a follow over there after this interview. Link will be in the video description. If you're enjoying that type of content, make sure you do subscribe to the channel, bell notification icon, like the video up as well. And of course, leave your comments down below if you have something to say or questions to ask. I do intend to get Gareth on the channel in the future. And I've also got other massive interviews coming up on the channel with the likes of one of my favorite economists of all time, Phil Anderson. So don't go anywhere, stay tuned to the channel and enjoy today's interview with Gareth. I might just start with uh, you know your, your style, your strategy, Strategy, just a little bit about you, and then we'll get into the, the big heavy questions that everyone wants to know about Bitcoin and the recession and how things are going. Yeah, sure. So, so my background is, uh, you know, about 20 years now of trading. Um, you know, I, I kind of grew up in a household that, that we didn't have a lot of money. I was never exposed to investing and I was in school and getting close to going to university. And, um, and, and I kind of had to figure out like, well, what would look good on my resume for school, you know, and, and I, I saw the investing club. So I said, let me give it a whirl. And it happened to be in the late 90s when the dot-com bubble was was growing. And so all of a sudden, you know, with a fake account back then, and, you know, I was making, you know, my fake 100,000 turned into two to three. I mean, very crypto-esque, if you will, you know, to what happened in 2021. But it was so addicting for someone that didn't come from money. So so I, I basically fell in love with trading. And, and I said, this is what I have to do. Um, after going to the university, I, I worked at a, at a job trying to do wealth management. But... But they had me on just cold calling and kind of like nothing to do with investing. And, and so I quit that and I just had 10,000 bucks to my name and I went off and tried to learn how to trade my own money. And um, unfortunately, it didn't go great in the beginning, just like every trader. You know, you guys, those of you guys watching, you may have tried it and it was really hard. It was hard for me back then, too. And I worked three side jobs to replenish my trading account and I replenished it so many times I couldn't even tell you. But over the time, over time, I started to study charts I started to look for support resistance lines, what was working, what wasn't working. And I developed kind of a, a distinct discipline um, following charts and, and analyzing charts. And, and that really led me to, to start in the money stocks.com and then eventually verified investing crypto. And then here we are today. When you say you replenished your account, if you were a real marketer, like we see on crypto and YouTube, you would say you went bankrupt multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's what it was. I mean, you know, I had, I went to a prop firm back then and, and they gave me $50,000 to trade off of my 10. But obviously when I took a loss, it didn't come out of their pocket. It came out of my money. And so, so, I mean, I would, I would lose two, three, four, five thousand, 5,000 and, you know, you'd get to a point where it was so little money. It was hard to day trade as your sole kind of generating, you know, uh, financial you know, thing. And then, and then I had to just continue to work and just, I, I saved whatever I could and put it back into that account. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was one of those things where it was a labor of love and I was just so intrigued. And, and, you know, the, the, the thought of making big money as an investor and trader was so addicting that I wasn't going to give up. And, uh, and, and it turned out well in the long run, but it was, it was certainly a hard road. How long do you think that takes? Just as a quick idea, you know, people are always wondering how many years or they want it to be weeks, especially in a crypto bull oh. market. I know. I mean, everyone wants it to be simple, but to be honest, I didn't have a lot of guidance back then. I didn't have any courses. There wasn't, I mean, this was kind of like pre-internet or just at the start of the internet. So you didn't have a, I didn't have a lot of, of, you know, resources. And so it probably took me like a good five years to become profitable as a trader. So I mean, think about that. Think about dedicating five years. But the other thing I would say to people is that if you were going to be a brain surgeon, if you were going to be a doctor, I mean, you literally have to devote that many years to studying your craft to get good at it. So, so people need to understand that is that being a trader is one of the most empowering financially independent things you can do if you're good at it. And so it makes sense that it wouldn't be easy. If it was easy, everyone would do it. Exactly. And how's that changed your like your risk appetite over the years going from those early days to now, now, now that you're successful in that realm, you know, we, yeah, you see I mean, that's, crypto, that's you know what's amazing, saying? right? Just like everyone out there in the crypto world or, or the stock world, I started out trying to hit home runs, um, you know, make tons of money on one trade. 
And, and I found that that would, it would work for a few times and I'd be thinking I was the best. And I was like, Oh, I, I finally got this down. And then one bad trade would wipe me out. Right. It would take 50% of my account away. And, and so really, as I grew, I started to recognize that singles and doubles, like small little wins are the way to go. And that's how you build real wealth because then eventually you're going to have that bad trade. And so you can't let that bad trade wreck your account. And if it takes away two winners, so be it. At least that's then you just need two winners to get back in the green or back to flat. And you can. So, yeah, it sounds a lot like what we talk about often is money management, risk management. It's not just about funding these hundred X's. So, I think that's a good place for us at least to build on when we start talking about uh, everything else that is going on out there the recession, trying to make big money and, you know, when to buy. But uh, I just wanted to ask quickly your style and type of analysis, you know, technicals, fundamentals. What do you look at? Price, time, pattern, cycles? Yeah, so so I'm I'm really a TA person. Um, I like to call myself like technical analysis with a side of markets and human psychology. I think human psychology is really beneficial to understanding why moves go so dramatic in one direction before they reverse, because you get this kind of with you know waterfall effect where everyone's piling in or everyone's exiting, and that's kind of the culmination of the up or down move. And so it's it's really looking at that, but then also looking at supports and resistance and topping tails and bottoming tails and trend lines and, and even market cycles and time counts and stuff like that. But really, for the most part, it's, it's almost no fundamentals. It's all this kind of psychology mixed with technical analysis. All right. And then you wouldn't sort of class yourself as a particular style of tra- uh, technical analysis, maybe just more like, uh, you know, traditional TA. Yeah, I, I think traditional TA, I don't really use a lot of indicators. Like, you know, when I show my charts in a little while, you guys will see that I use trend lines and maybe occasionally fibs and, and stuff like that. But I don't have a bunch of crazy stuff. I find that like the chart to me, and this is kind of an interesting take on it, is is like imagine looking at a chart and, and instead of a chart, it was like a foreign language that you didn't know. And then the idea is that once you learn how to read that chart, it's like you're learning that language and the chart will speak to you. It will show you things, whether it's a wide range candle, a reversal candle, an engulfing candle. Like these are things that tell you and and they don't tell you certainties. Right. And you know this and and I'm sure your audience does is that there's no such thing as 100 percent in the market. It's all about probabilities. Right. So the idea is you want to be the house, the casino, not the gambler. And the casino, yes, they take losses sometimes, but generally over time, they always are winning. I wanted just to switch gears a little bit and just now start to get into the, the broader stuff. We'll go with the macros and then get into, you know, cryptos and whatnot. Um, you know, like the main thing, there's so many main headlines at the moment. So, you know, we've got inflation, we've got recession, we've got depression, people talking about multi-year bear markets. It's it's absolutely wild. I think that then speaks to what you were talking about earlier in terms of your own style of analysis, where it is, uh, you just start to see the headlines for what they are. So I guess, look, I've said, I've said a lot there. Let's just break it down first up. Your thoughts on the inflation side of things. How is that affecting the market? Do you think it's as big of a deal as what the news, the media is making it out to be? I think it is because it creates this fear and panic in the investing public, which then reacts, right? So so it's going to that psychology of an investor. But the beautiful thing about it is the charts are amazing in that they tell you when the changes are going to come. And in fact, if you would, so let me, let me show like my dollar chart here, my Dixie chart. Um, Take a look at this guys. So like the dollar had this big fall today, but look at where it was. Like the chart was telling you, like, look at this trend line pivot high from early 2022 to this high and to this high. And so really it told you something was going to happen. And and another chart that's just fascinating is the British pound versus the U.S. dollar. And like, this is where we know that the the Bank of England intervened by saying that they were going to start buying bonds again. But what's amazing is the chart almost told you something like this was going to happen. And this is what I always say is that the charts tell you news is going to come out or something's going to affect the the price of something. You just don't know what it is. Like I didn't know the Bank of England was going to intervene. I just knew that, look at this. It was a 19, from 1985, the British pound was hitting a double bottom. And so the beauty of the chart is it's it's telling you something is likely going to happen. And then miraculously, the Bank of England intervenes. And then you have this bounce that goes on. And the, and the stock market here in the U.S. really ripped up today as well. We saw some gains in crypto as well. That's exactly what we look at when we talk about cycles. It's like we know there's a timing coming up here. We don't know what 
the government is going to do, but the timing is telling you something is is about to happen. And that's exactly what we look at when it, you know, we're looking at the charts. It's almost at those ex- exact peak moments that the news comes out with the most the, the most major headlines. You know, yesterday it was just great great British pound collapsing. It's going to go further. Euro is going to collapse. It's going to go further. I saw you know those headline crypto Twitter accounts who were basically for retail only saying everything is about to collapse. And then what do you get the next day? A reversal. Yeah. And, and I think that's such a true, you know, like, like you, you, and this is one of the things I pay attention to. I do follow Twitter, not because I think it's a great asset for me to trade off of, but in fact, it's a great asset for me to use as a contrarian indicator. And the key to a good investor is being able to figure out when it's at these kind of maximum megaphone periods where it's just overwhelmingly biased in one direction. And then that's usually the inflection point. What else do you use for that? A fear and greed index or something else? Yeah. So the fear and greed index is okay. It does give you a general sense, but I haven't found it to be a great for like exact reversals. I would tell you another thing to look for is like, I'll tune into the, the, the financial media and the financial media, like, you know, you'll have on, you know, CNBC here in the U S and, and, and they'll be talking all bearishly and all this and that. And like, Oh, this is so scary. And you can almost gauge from that when it's, when it's really powerful that they are in one direction, that it's about to reverse. Over the years, it's become easier. But as a newbie, you might hear that every day and not be able to distinguish the strength of that signal. Is there any way you could sort of, you know, from your experience, explain that to a new person? Because every day almost sounds bad. How do you know one day is worse than the other? Is- yeah, no, you're so right on that. And it is really hard. It's, it's honestly taken me even longer than becoming a profitable in, in trader longer to kind of get my timing down to be more accurate because i would say i would say it's one thing to be able to look and say oh you know there's going to be this big move in the markets like oh the the stock market is going to top out well people thought that years ago and then we've seen that reversal back down finally but it, it's that timing and it is honestly very hard because an individual investor is going to also have these emotional kind of fears in them and it's a matter of you getting that under control as a trader and being able to be very much robotic where then you get to a point where you can start analyzing and just you kind of it's, it's almost something that comes over time where where when you go through enough bull and bear periods in different markets, you start to notice, well, this is a lot of people saying it's bullish, but it's not to that crazy level yet. Gotcha. So to become profitable just in trading, it needs to be far more objective so that we can measure our results. With the news media, it's a little bit more subjective. And then over time, you start to build on that to be able to use that as an objective piece of your plan. It's um, it's probably not something you'd want to start with because there is no way to accurately measure it. Yes, yeah. that's, that's exactly right. right. I would say like like technicals on a chart are very much defined. Like a bottoming tail is a bottoming tail. You know, you know those things are very easy to just learn, and once you learn it, you look to spot it. It's it's that second layer of kind of the, the psychological analysis of the market that does take just a lot of time and effort of of just monitoring things over time to get down. So looking at how bearish things have just become, what are your thoughts on the bear market? And if you want to throw in your thoughts with the, say, the recession and the depression talks and how long this could last, et cetera. I do think that we are headed into a global recession. But remember that recessions don't, you know, the markets don't trade in a straight line. So so you're going to get to these technical levels where people get overly bearish. And then you get these technical bounces, like, for instance, when the Bank of England does something like this. Um, and then what you'll see is people start to sway and start to get bullish again. And then as soon as they start getting bullish in a bear market, you have to be on alert that it's likely not going to go too much further. So I don't think, for instance, a one day bounce is all we're going to get here. But I certainly do think we are going to go lower across the board on all stock markets and, and really start to head lower. I'm kind of isolating down and I can show my S&P chart here. Sure. SPX. There's a pivot point that I'm watching. So number one, notice where we bounced today. We bounced right at the lows from June. So a technical support level right there. I think this is a short-lived bounce. You might get a week, week and a half, two weeks out of it. But ultimately, we have to go retest the pre-COVID collapse highs right here. So that's down around 3370 on the S&P 500. And that makes a lot of sense, right? If you think about the Federal Reserve sucking all this liquidity out of the market, it makes sense that we have to go back to the pre-period before all this liquidity was put into the market. So, so that would be my next stopping point. I think by year-end we get there. Then, And the that is your then, fundamentals coming into the market. Just to add that in, because you know we often talk just about technicals, but right. that's basically a fundamental piece. 
Right. That is true. That is true. Just sucking out the, that fundamental money that was printed. I also think at, at a basis, I'm going to be looking to buy this level right here just because it is such a psychologically technical level right there. So there'll be a bounce off of that. But again, I'm in the camp where you're going to have two cycles to this bear market. The first cycle we're in right now, which is a cycle where the Fed is tightening. There's no more money printing. And so valuations have to come down. The second cycle is going to be after the Fed pivots, right? So the Fed is going to eventually pivot. We saw kind of the Bank of England already do that, right? So at that point, you're going to see a big bounce in the market because the Fed is pivoted. Everyone's going to say, oh, they're going back to easy money policy. I don't agree with that. I think the pivot is basically just not hiking rates anymore. And the next cycle is going to be when the economy slips into a recession and that Without Fed printing of money, if you think back to every past big market drop, whether it's a recession or it was COVID or whatever, the Fed has been printing us out. And so with inflation still staying above 4%, I have a long-term horizon of like multiple years where inflation is going to be 4% or so. The Fed cannot print us out of the next recession. And the market is eventually going to realize that. And that's going to be a big earth shattering factor for the overall market where they're like, wait a minute. How does the, the economy get out of this recession without the help of the Fed? And that's where you see that next leg down where people say, OK, now we could be in a recession for years. I mean, it could be a multi-year recession, not just a six or 12 month recession period. And looking at that uh, support level there, if that was to happen sooner, say in a week or four weeks, if we just get that quick flush dump out of it, would that then change your mind in terms of timing? Or maybe we hang around those lows a bit longer and form a base? Yeah. So overall, to me, the, the speed at which it comes down just would dictate how big of a bounce we would get off of it. So the, the faster it would fall, like for instance, if we were to go straight into it, let's say in the next two weeks, I would actually look for a pretty solid bounce back to this pivot high right here or this pivot low. But overall, it, it wouldn't change the aspect of what I'm seeing in the charts, right? It still wouldn't change anything about what I'm looking for, where I still think we have to go at minimum down to the lower end here. And I want to show you this trend line. This is a pretty powerful trend line here to see. And look at this one right here. So this is another major trend line where this is a long-term trend line where you could actually extend this out to 2009. And, and basically, that is the long-term trend of this market. So just because we're going to 33.70 or so, I still think we have to go even lower before you get to any sort of longer-term bottom in the market. Yeah, if you did extend it out to 2009, I mean, I, I use a bit of GAN analysis and looking at the uh, the 50% from the, the low to the high, which you know I do on my channel a fair bit, I think it comes out at around 2,700 points. And so just looking... Just looking closely at yours, it was about 27. And then I'm also looking at 32, which was the bottoms, 3,200 points just underneath the uh, the September lows there in 2021. Yeah. So it's similar to your 33 there. Yeah. And bit. I love that, by yeah. the way, that you're, you're a technical guy. So we speak the same languages. It's very cool. <laughs> It makes it so much easier because you just know that there's going to be these levels eventually come up and provided it stays within that zone, for me, that's like the stronger half. If it starts to drop below those significant key macro support levels of multi-years, that's that's the real weakness. Whereas for now, it's like it's just a correction, the way I see it anyway, a correction in a bigger cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I think the bottom line is, I mean, and this is the thing though, is a lot of people out there will hear this and they'll be like, Oh my goodness, you know, this is horrible. We're going to keep going down. But honestly, there is so much money to be made in this market because when you do get bounces in bear markets, as you know, they're huge bounces. So you just really, it becomes a market where the good investors and traders that can read the charts can time the market much better. But when you get these bounces, they are tremendous and there's a lot of money to be made both on the long and the short side. You mentioned something about like a multi-year bear. What what does that, I guess, entail? Because I've seen that in headlines, um, you know, from other interviews and yeah. you know, news outlets are going to use it and all these sort of guys are going to use it. But does that mean this market just goes down and down and down for years? Or does that just mean that we stay underneath the previous old all-time highs for years? Like what, how do we define that so that yeah, we're not so, getting so, scooped up in super, you know, super big headlines? Yeah. So, so, and again, I know that sounds really scary, but like, I think the best thing to do is look at like other markets that have gone through this. Right. So, so number one, if you looked at the, the NASDAQ in the dot com period, um, it had this insane move. In fact, let's go to that now. In fact, let's take a look at the NASDAQ chart. 
And then I'm going to go to the monthly chart just because so we can see back to 2000. And what you can see in 2000, it was very similar to like, you know, the vertical nature is kind of what we've seen here. I mean, look at look at the vertical nature here. And by the way, look at how big this is compared to this. I mean, that's yeah. how scary this market is. But as you can see, I mean, you had a generally a pretty big drop, but there were some big bounces along the way. And then you went into this kind of sideways to up, like almost like a bull market within a bear market period where where you actually could make money by just going long. Just the highs were not taken out for 15 years. And I think another good example of this would be like the, the Hang Seng market. So if we look at the Hang Seng market here, which is the Chinese stock market, and we look at this, right? So here in 2003, we, we, the Hang Seng market had this insane run. You then had this epic collapse. But then look at the market since then. I mean, it gave plenty of opportunities for these ups and down mega moves where there was lots of money to be made. It just never really took out the highs and broke higher. So, I mean, if you're looking at the China stock market here, I mean, you could have gotten in at the highs of 07 and you're still down significantly on your money. And this is kind of what I expect for the U.S. stock market to go through this period of digestion. Another good example of this would be the EWZ, which is the um, the the Brazilian ETF or the Brazilian stock market. And you can see here, look at this mega move from 2003 to 2008. And then you had this epic drop, which is kind of what I think is going to happen in the next, you know, between what we've already seen in the next and the next 12 months is what I'm envisioning for us. Then you're going to have these big bounces, but generally the market is trailing lower here. So I think, you know, for me, this is kind of a good playbook for what I think the U.S. stock market and, and some of these global stock markets overall that have had big bull moves will probably go through. Australia is definitely in that same pattern, which is why I don't invest in Australian stocks. It's just the same thing. It's just, It had a big boom and nothing has really taken off. The Aussie one is um, ASX or XJO. Uh, very similar. Would you split the NASDAQ and the S&P because of those runs? NASDAQ is tech, booms and busts are bigger, longer cycles to get out of those periods. S&P, you know, it's made up of everything else, financials, tech, uh, consumer staples, etc. So I do think the S&P is kind of, it's a little bit more diversified, but what's still kind of scary about the S&P is that stocks like Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, um, Google, Amazon, they still make up like 20, 25% of the S&P. They've gotten so big. So I do think that overall, you may be a little bit more cushioned in the S&P 500, but I think also you're still going to see a lot of these same effects. So I just don't think much like the tech.com bubble, when the, when the NASDAQ fell, it fell the most. The S&P still had a nasty drop. It just wasn't quite as dramatic. And maybe similar pattern to what happened into the peak of 2007. You had like banking take off which sort of held the the index up but tech was still lagging so you got that double top into 2007 we had the drop it reaccumulated then took off again so yeah, yeah. I, I can see something similar with the aussie market you know we only have mining and banking here so if one lags the other's just trying to pull it up and it's only until both go together that you get this this takeoff yeah exactly let's switch over to the dixie you know it's been the big headline at the moment uh, thoughts around Dixie taking out all global reserve currencies and it being over for the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I've kind of been in the more bearish camp lately with the dollar. I, I think number one, it's gotten way overdone. Um, I also think that these other these other central banks, and we're starting to see it, are kind of in the position of saying, "Hey, listen, we need to kind of stabilize our currencies against the U.S. dollar." So. Number one, I think they're talking to the U.S. Fed and kind of coordinating. Like, I'm sure that when the Bank of England made this decision of what they ended up doing in the overnight or last night in the overnight for me, they they did talk to the Federal Reserve and let them know. So I do think there's some communication between central banks. But I think for the most part, you know, I, I'm still a long term bear on the dollar. I just think that in this kind of period where we're looking at a global recession, where you have Russia invading Ukraine, maybe China and Taiwan, the dollar is still king dollar. And so it's still going to be the strongest, even though longer term, 10 years from now, I do think the power of the dollar does wane significantly. So you're not in this camp that Bitcoin is going to become the world reserve currency, the dollar is going down, China is going to take over, 
that's not how bearish you are on the dollar? Um, so, so not in the near term. I, I actually do think that in the longer term. So I don't think Bitcoin is going to be the reserve currency. I look at Bitcoin as more like the the digital gold. So I think it becomes more of that commodity. Um, so I think that's where where you see. Bitcoin go. I actually do think the digital yuan does eventually become the reserve currency. It just takes so much time. I mean, you know, these countries are so addicted to everything being run in U.S. dollars that it takes just a long time for it to switch over. But I do think it's a process that will happen. And I do think as that switch happens to another reserve currency, remember, all these countries hold trillions, well, maybe not trillions, but at least hundreds of billions of dollars because it's the reserve currency and they have to do all these transactions. So as it does, as it wanes as the reserve currency, these countries won't have to hold dollars as much and you'll see more and more dumping of the dollar on the open market. And that alone will create a situation where the dollar does decline. So I would say near term, you respect the dollar. I think you're going to have pullbacks, but it stays strong. Longer term, I am a bear on the dollar. I find it really hard to fathom that people would go or countries would go to China, seeing as they have so many controls over it. They, they're not easy going with that currency. And so it's, you can't really trust it. And I, I think, yeah. although the dollar, I do think the dollar will probably come down eventually. I don't know if it's going to be this cycle or the next, but there's got to be a different currency that people go to. I'm not saying Bitcoin either. I just don't know what it is. You know, say yeah. World, World War One or two, it was so UK versus Germany. And then the, the leading power that came out of it was the US. You know, yeah. and they became the dollar. I'll throw, one more, I'll throw throw one more conspiracy into the mix here. And Please. this is something I've, I've thought about. But think about this. The pound is almost at par with the dollar. The euro is almost at par with the dollar. Could it be that these currencies are being driven to par value to create a new world currency that basically is, is uniting a lot of the world? And again, I don't know if that's the case, but it is kind of interesting if we see all these currencies kind of go to the same price, then why not create a, a one power currency that would then become the future reserve currency? I don't know. I don't mind that theory. I haven't heard that one before, but you know, <laughs> it could switch back. People would say, well, it's never gone back to the same reserve currency over the last you know, 500 or 1,000 years of history. The only other one, like Southeast Asia, just I, I can't see a power coming yeah. in, even though they are some of the strongest. The only way I see the digital yuan actually becoming the reserve currency is, well, number one, China is powerful enough and they're going to become more and more powerful. But but I think they would have to really open up their, their economic scenarios and you'd have to have a much more open economy for it to happen. But in general, I do think that over time that will happen. So the question is, how long does it take? And then is the digital yuan still a powerhouse at that point? Probably not as soon as everyone thinks it's going to be. No. Uh, you know, you get that feeling that it, the dollar has to crash now. The, the yuan's coming this decade, you know, 2030, no. it's going to be one. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're talking definitely outside even past 2030, probably before that does happen. What might happen in this particular decade, crypto going lower, what are our low targets and what do we think with the highs? Let's start with the lows for Bitcoin, the crypto crash right now. Okay, so so right now crypto getting a little bit of a bid as the dollar has fallen. Um, per the chart, we're in this bigger wedge pattern. So again, if I zoom out, this is pretty remarkable wedge pattern where you basically had the all time high down sloping trend line. If we can break above that, it gives you a little bit of a short-term short squeeze on Bitcoin. Overall, I don't see it lasting for very long, and I ultimately see more downside. Right now, my high-end target on Bitcoin is around the twelve to 13,000 level, which would put us right down here at this pivot. Um, right now, we're still hovering around that 2017 all-time high uh, before the last bear market. But I do think eventually it gets pushed below this level and collapses down to again, 12 to 13,000. Uh, I know a lot of people have heard the headline of like Gareth says it could go as low as 3,500. Um, that's kind of a worst case scenario for me where if we really see, uh, you know, the financial markets collapse, we know that Bitcoin is kind of follows the financial markets. It hasn't become a kind of a goldish type thing yet. Then you could be looking at a $3,500 target. Long term, I love Bitcoin. I think there's a huge place in the economy, in the global economy for it. But but again, cycles are cycles. And we can't deny the fact that, number one, we're in a bear cycle. Number two, this is the first bear cycle that you haven't had Fed printing of money, which means it probably is going to be a worse bear cycle than past bear cycles. And we haven't even corrected 80% yet, which is what the past cycles did. So you have to kind of take that into, into, into kind of analysis. 
where I get my $3,500 target. If you compare the dot-com era to the, the last couple of years in crypto where you saw Dogecoin and SHIB and, and I mean these crazy meme coins and some of these coins going up thousands and thousands and thousands of percent. If that was the equivalent of what happened in the dot-com era and Amazon in the dot-com era collapsed 95% before going up tens of thousands of percentage points, then you have to think maybe a 95% correction in Bitcoin could occur, in which case you're looking at 3,500. All right. So that's where that number comes from, just as an absolute worst case. But essentially, it still remains above the previous lows, which in technical sense, it's putting in higher lows. Yes, higher lows on the chart, correct. Um, so you're looking at the June, June right here. Um, but I think it's you have to you have to kind of keep in mind that this is a bearish. This could be a bearish pattern. If we go to the parallel channel, right? We put a trend line below these lows here, and we drag this up. You basically are creating this. And and so when I'm talking about maybe a breakout from here, you probably would head as high as this level here, which is around twenty five thousand. But you're still in a sideways channel, which from this drop, or you could look at a bigger drop, it's still bearish as of now. It hasn't flipped to bullish yet on Bitcoin. Yeah, and I, I tend to agree with that. Just the volatility is just getting sucked out of this market, even though we're getting swung a thousand bucks here and there. People are getting excited, but there's just well, the energy is basically dying at the moment. It, so, it is, and which, by the way, so there's two things that tells you. First of all, the stock market has been more volatile than Bitcoin. I never thought I'd say that, but that's been the case. And then number two is that this quiet periods are the periods before big moves. So you know something big is coming. Think about the eye of a storm where it's very quiet, but then when you come out of the eye of the storm, it gets real crazy. So at some point, something is going to trigger here, either a big move up or a big move down. Which is kind of fitting considering you're in a hurricane at the moment. That's right. That's right. I'm in a hotel room for everyone. I, mean, I had, to, had to leave the house and everything. It's pretty crazy stuff. The strength or the stability of Bitcoin, even though the dollar has gone up, does that mean anything in your analysis? I guess what I'm getting at is, for me, I see that as slightly stronger than other assets because while the dollar's going up, Bitcoin has remained during this channel, whereas others have started to fall. Yeah, that's you know you're absolutely correct on that. Especially over the last week or so in Bitcoin, I was commenting on how the stock market was really falling until today. Uh, the dollar was really shooting up, and and crypto really has gone sideways. So I agree with you. That's a short term bullish indicator. Um, again, I wouldn't look at that as a longer term signal of a bottom yet. Sure. But short term, absolutely, and that kind of gives us gives us a play where where if we look at this here, and let me just erase this trend line, but you have this this kind of channel. And look at where we've been hovering, right at the lows. And if you look here, we bounced. Here off of this line, we bounced. Now we've been hovering here, and it's held up. So maybe we have one more trigger to go up to about 25000 Then the question is, can we break above that? And that's going to be the big question there. But but I wouldn't, you know, the way it's been acting, it's been very, very healthy for Bitcoin to be holding up while the stocks have been going down and while the dollar has been going up. Spot on. And maybe that could just be another trap to the pump side up and then Bitcoin collapses. Well, I guess we just got to wait and see. But the, being in a trend, it's just difficult to get a clear direction as yet. We just know that there are always going to be a lot of volatility traps. So your low side target for Bitcoin with those support levels, pretty much that's what's happened on the way down around that 12 to 14K. Otherwise, worst case scenario, looking around 3,500. Do you do much in the way of Ethereum? A little bit on Ethereum. I'm, I'm more of a swing trader on Ethereum at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, Ethereum, it's it's still well above these lows from June. Um, it looks like it held this retrace. And this is just a, a great example of technicals where you had this, you can see pivot high, pulled back, pivot high, pulled back, broke out. And we know that when you break out, it, charts tend to want to come back to home base. Where was that breakout? Well, guess what? It was right there. It came right there and has kind of held up relatively well. Now, if we rally up, this downsloping trend line becomes the resistance point. Now, with the merge, I mean, it's kind of been a little bit of a crazier analysis point on the merge. But but right now, again, you're holding support on Ethereum, and, and it wouldn't shock me to see us go up and test this trend line up here. My viewers would know I was just saying, like, I'm not buying ETH in that whole merge craziness through crypto Twitter and YouTube. Yeah. Again, it just played out time and time again. The merge, the merge, the merge, and dump. And the same thing happened back in March. You know, that merge, 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 it went up, and then the dump. 
it's yeah. um it's wild how often it works to sell uh, the news sell the news event and, <laughs> and i always say this to people is that like emotion like if you're in a bear market that's the most powerful thing like if we were in a bull market then it probably would have gone to all-time highs right or or would have you know but but you have to recognize what type of market you're trading through where it, instead of a buy the dip market it's a sell the rip market so you get these gifts of these big moves and you have to be selling into them definitely gold silver do you get into that at all yeah so i've been a big gold bug all year long disappointed honestly <laughs> um in some ways, right? So, so a couple things to keep in mind. And by the way, gold had just an awesome move today, uh, big move up. But number one, if you're trading in euros or yen, gold's done amazingly well this year. If you're trading in dollars, I think gold's down what seven six percent on the year. Which, by the way, it, it's been one of my favorite assets for 2022, and at least it's been the best performer in an otherwise nasty market, right? Bitcoin down huge, S and P, Nasdaq down huge. You know, if you're down 7% while everyone else is down 20 to 30 to 40%, you're doing pretty well. Um, I still think that gold is going to be a big mover. Um, the chart in the longer term is very bullish to me. So if you look at where this chart was going back to 2018, it had this big bullish move up. Well, it's been digesting that, right? Charts, when they have these big moves, it takes a long time to digest. And I think that You've seen that digestion going on in gold. I think you broke below this line mainly just because of the such such a strong dollar move. But ultimately, I think this is a chart that will eventually break out to the upside. And I think it, you're. I do think you're headed to three thousand or or greater on on gold. Maybe as early as 2023, 2024. So soon. I, I'm looking at it as a multi year play here because it takes so long to, to for these moves to happen. But yeah. I definitely still see that as a, a pullback. Sure, there's a double top. We've got to just digest that as you say and then start that multi-year move back to higher prices oh i was going to say i mean and this is just such a cool technical point but i'm erasing these trend lines on purpose because i want to show you guys so the last time we had inflation like we did do now was in the 70s into the 80s and what you actually see is that the chart is almost identical right so so let's look at this chart right so we had this big move up here from 2018 to 2020 and then this kind of choppy sideways down move. And if we go back, if we go to the monthly chart and we go back to the 1970s on gold and bear with me as I get back there here. Mm. So let me, uh, let me zoom in here. So what you can see here is that, and let me just try to get in. So look at this. And let me just try to get my arrows here. So imagine if this was the move from 2018 to 2020. And then this is the move from 20 to 22, which is what we're experiencing now. And, and notice how the inflation is the same, right? I mean, you're seeing this massive 8 10% inflation. Well, that was basically what we were seeing back then. But look at what gold did eventually. It had this monstrous move. Now, again, I don't think gold's going to do the equivalent of a 1,000% move up. But I do think this is the next move. And this is a very common pattern, right? Big move, digestion big, big move coming. And so that's kind of what I'm thinking is, is going to happen with gold coming up over the next few years. Also with that pattern, I, I, I tend to agree as well, especially as what I see we're leading into this next stage of a bull market after a digestion, which will be quite significant. Doesn't mean S&P has to go to brand new, massive all-time highs. But just in terms of years, that can take quite some time. I think it's like it was 75 or 76 until it got there in the 80s. Yeah. But then, you had, then you had the down cycle of commodities. And I would be very careful holding on to these commodities after such a boom you know the the cycles 25 30 years up and 25 30 years down and yeah. if we put bitcoin into that if we get another blow off move with bitcoin or just a good move up it could be could be a long time before we see new all time highs again for bitcoin after another cycle if bitcoin is a, a commodity as well and sort of moves in the same cycles I think that's great analysis, and I agree 100. percent Is that and by, and any time you get these dramatic moves, like you have to be personally, you have to be a little crazy to kind of expect more and more. And this is what drove me nuts with Bitcoin is that you know you had these crazy moves on Bitcoin, and people were like, oh, but it's going to go to 250 thousand dollars next month, and like you know, and it's just oh, at certain points, it's just not realistic, and and you're getting into these ridiculous realms. And you have to be very much grounded, right? As an investor, we talked about this earlier. You want to almost be a robot where when you see something that's ridiculous, react to it. You know, at least take some off the table, but leaving it all on the table, just hoping to hit, hit the jackpot and win the lottery, that's ludicrous in the investing world. 
we could talk generally about um, the real estate market overall. Just a quick comment about if this market is going down, are you seeing land overall going down, the value of land? Of course, the houses will because it's the brick and mortar. They have to depreciate, but the land itself, we're not seeing it here in Oz anyway. Yeah, so I, I think, I think right. So I think the two differences, right, you have housing, which is obviously correcting. I mean, especially here in the U.S., and I can't speak for how it was in Australia, but but here in the U.S., things got ridiculous. People were paying 100000 over asking. You know, there were 10 bids on a, on a property, and it was just, it was just honestly, it was exactly what you look for when it's a bubble. And so you mm -hmm. have to know as an investor to say, you know what, I'm not going to chase. I'm not going to get caught up in the hype. Now, when it comes to land, I mean, the one thing to always remember is they're not making any more of it. So, so that's the positive about buying land. I don't know. I'm not well enough versed in what land values are right now to know if they've kept pace with the housing market. But, but I certainly think that while you may get bounces when interest rates pull back, um, the wealth effect from the stock market decline, the crypto market, all of that is going to impact people's ability to purchase houses. Plus, interest rates being higher are just making it so expensive that you will see you will see that the housing market continue, at least in the U.S., to correct. I've got a slightly different view on this because it is the same thing that a lot of people talk about. You know, interest rates have come back. Uh, people can't afford it anymore, et cetera, et cetera. But we're seeing a lot of institutions, funds buying up the property and they're all buying it in large numbers. And so even if the interest rates go up, that's still a better return for them to be buying up all this land. And so sometimes I think people are getting a little bit skewed with saying, well, no, the, the average person can't afford it. Sure. But the fund can afford a thousand, 10,000 times more than those few people. And I'm like, it's, it's, they're still holding up in terms of land values across the board. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right on in terms of that. I mean, again, you know, with the big money buying up, it's probably going to kind of cushion any sort of downside to some extent. But the question is, right, is, is that, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I'm well enough first to know more than just the retail buyer of real estate and the costs have just soared exponentially. But you're right. I mean, if, if the funds are buying it up, then then it does probably put some sort of floor under it. Yeah, it I think it's a big possibility and, and a lot of people might get lost and missed the opportunity that that's my belief at this point which is why i'm still buying um land and also the move up it's like we see this exponential move or a really big move and you get corrections and so people are sort of freaking out with this few percent drop back five percent maybe some areas 10 maybe it's only just the unit market or what you guys call apartments or condos like that's getting a bit of a pullback but it just went up 100%, 70%. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's got to it's got to have a correction. We had to look at the worst case. Maybe we can end with a, a best case scenario if uh, things tend to work out over the next year or two. You know, what happens over the next uh, year to two, and then to five years. Yeah, so I, I think yeah, and you're right. I mean, we don't want to be all doom and gloom. We want to look at all sides. A good trader, a good investor, always looks at the bad and the good side, and then kind of decides which one. And that, 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 by the way, that helps you with risk management as well to understand. You know, if you're going short, you have to know what's the opposite, and, and vice versa on the long side. So I think I think for me, if we saw the Fed somehow engineer a soft landing, and the global central banks kind of uh, in Europe figure out how to get their economies. To at least come back to a little bit of growth, that would be the best case. I also think you have to get inflation down. Uh, so far, we haven't seen it come down. I do expect it to start to moderate quite a bit, but I just, I still am struggling with figuring out how it's going back below 2%. Um, and then lastly, I think you look at scenarios like if the war in, in Ukraine were to somehow end and, and things were to improve dramatically there, the gas supply is resupplying to Europe. You have a lot of scenarios for growth and a reemergence of the economy, at least over in that area of the world. So, so there are positives. Um, it looks bleak right now, but I think I think the big thing is for you and me, we follow the charts, and the charts should guide us. I mean, the beautiful thing about it is we should see in the charts that some of these positives may come out. So, although we could be extremely bearish on things, and there could be some lows coming in, if you really start to see that institutional smart money buying up at lows, and we're just not getting that push down while the media is extremely fearful, to me, that's like a, you know, a, a bit of a alarm bell saying, hey, someone is buying here, even though the media is telling me it should get a lot worse. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree. Look for that. Look for those signals. And like you, like you pointed out on Bitcoin, that's something that to pay attention to is that Bitcoin was not flushing 
when the stock market was dropping, when the dollar was soaring here? And does that mean we're going to get this short term rip up in Bitcoin? And again, who knows how high it goes, but but just little signals like that for the near term swing trades are great to look for. It's been fantastic having you on, Gareth. We should do it again soon. Just update things. Yeah, I would Keen love to that. come back. I appreciate you giving me some time and chatting with me. It's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Uh, we'll also have, uh, you know, we can get into some more questions, some more details. So guys, if you're watching and you want to leave some questions down below in the comments, do that. We'll get Gareth back on. People can find you on Twitter, which I'll leave a link to in the video description. Go follow, follow Gareth over there. There's heaps of good stuff, uh, you know, technical analysis and charts. Any, any last words? Well, get educated, right? I think that's the biggest thing. Learn the charts, learn how to read charts. Um, you can find some good information. I have a website where I put up some interesting educational content called verifiedinvestingeducation.com. Uh, so check that out and, uh, and just be safe in this market. Lots of crazy moves. Don't get, basically avoid the hype. Avoid the hype, learn the charts. Spot on. All right, mate. Thank you so much. Everyone, thanks again for, for joining us. Peace out till next time.